Hi, Dr. Osborne here to talk about gluten sensitivity. And I hope that uh, by the end of this lecture, you'll understand what gluten sensitivity is, what gluten is, what celiac disease is, and know the differences between them, and overall just have a better understanding of the topic. So the first question that we ask is what is gluten? Gluten is a mixture of protein found in grain. And really two key words in this phrase here, and that is all grain, not just some grain, not just select grains, but gluten is found in all grain. And gluten is actually this generic term that we use. It, it's more specifically gluten is made out of smaller pieces of proteins, and these are called prolamines and glutalins. Now, as you see here, there's a particular type of prolamine found in wheat, and it is called gliadin or gliadin. And this is the prolamine or the piece of gluten that is most associated with the development of celiac disease. Now I want to go to this diagram and show you a few things just so you can better understand grain and gluten and how they fit together. In this left hand column you can see the name of the grain. In the center you can see the top here it says prolamine. Well remember prolamine is a subfraction of gluten so this is the name of the gluten found in the different grains. And then this far hand column you can see percent total protein. This is the percent of gluten based on the total amount of protein that's found in the particular grain. So for example in terms of, of wheat, the gliadin in wheat consists of 69 percent of the, of the total protein found in wheat. So there's a lot of gluten in wheat and that's one of the reasons why wheat is typically the most detrimental of all the grains when we're talking about gluten sensitivity. Now you'll also see other grains here and these first four, wheat, rye, oats, and barley are your traditional uh, celiac grains but you can see I've listed a few other examples here, millet, corn, rice, and sorghum and you can see they all have their own types of gluten and they all have their own different concentrations of gluten as well. So what we've got here is we've got different grains containing different types of glutens and having different concentrations of those different types of glutens. As we go to this next slide you can see the definition of grain itself. Uh, grain is actually the seed of grass. So as grass grows it harbors a seed, that seed is actually what we consider to be a grain. Now what's important to know about gluten is we see here this layer is called an endosperm and this is where the bulk of the gluten is found in a grain. So typically when we take a grain we crush it down, we grind it, we mill it and we use this endosperm layer to make flour and in this endosperm you have the different types of grain prolamines and so therefore anybody who is grain intolerant or rather sensitive is going to potentially react to those prolamines very important concept because once again if you look at the definition that's being promoted on gluten sensitivity it states that gluten sensitivity is an immune reaction to the protein gluten found in wheat, barley, and rye but it makes no mention about corn or spelt or millet or amaranth or any of the other grains and even uh, sometimes this definition even though oats are classically considered to be part of this definition uh, depending on who you ask, a number of times you'll see that oats are gluten-free or you'll see gluten-free labeled on a package of oats. Now you got to remember, once again, oats are a grain and grains contain an endosperm and in that endosperm you have prolamines which are glutens. So it's impossible for oats to be gluten-free. So my advice to you is don't believe everything that you read on a food label that says gluten free. So that's the question here, why is it inconsistent? What is, what is it that makes it consistent? And one of the major reasons why it's inconsistent is because most of the original research that was performed on celiac disease identified wheat, barley, and rye as culprit grains um, and it's kind of stuck. It, that definition is about 60 years old and, and we haven't really changed it and I haven't seen any plans for anybody thinking about changing it in the medical literature, although I've seen a number of experts come out and try to um, try to delineate the differences between having a grain intolerance versus having just plain celiac disease. 
Okay, as we go to the next slide, you can see here I've just listed some research about some of these other grains just so that you can kind of see there is some thought in, in, in the literature about these other grains as being potentially harmful. As you can see here, maize prolamines had low but definite activity, and this activity is inflammatory activity, even though maize is typically reported to be a harmless gluten. In this next study, you can see this was done where there's a test called a rectal challenge test, and in, and in this particular study that was published in gut, uh, they compared corn gluten to wheat gluten and found that corn gluten created the same type of inflammatory reaction as did the wheat gluten. And as you can see here, this is a quote taken directly from the study. Uh, this reaction in some of our patients with celiac disease is intriguing as maize is considered safe and is recommended as the substitute cereal in a gluten-free diet. So once again, we're just questioning why are we recommending uh, maize as a substitute when we've got a couple of studies that are now showing that it actually is not 100% safe. We also go on to look at this other study, and in, and in this study I've kind of paraphrased or quoted the, the end of the article for you. You can see the allergens in rice, corn, millet, and buckwheat should be better studied before they can be recommended as alternatives for cereal allergic children. So even these, uh, even these doctors who prepared this paper uh, are, are making the same type of recommendation as, as far as these other grains are concerned. In this study, uh, high titers were found when celiac sera were tested against wheat glutenins, albumins, globulins, as well as against barley, oats, and maize prolamine. So just another study on the prolamine in corn creating problems, inflammatory problems, in celiac. There have been some new studies that have recently come out on rice, uh, as you can see here, the first one in the Journal of Pediatrics, and that is rice playing a role in creating enterocolitis is just a big fancy doctor word that means inflammation of the colon. So you can see rice protein in, in, inducing uh, inflammation in the colon. And in this next study you see more of the same thing. And so we've got now a couple of studies that have come out on rice and the protein in rice as being potentially problematic uh, in creating in, inflammatory disease in the colon. Now let's talk a little bit about definitional differences. There are a number of different terms that are being used out there and a lot of people will throw them around not really knowing the differences but just to, to break it down for you gluten allergy as you can see here is typically considered to be an allergic response an immune mediated response and I'll show you some diagrams here in a minute that break it down as to exactly what that means now gluten intolerance is considered to be an inability to tolerate gluten so the difference between these two terms is that one is your immune system reacts and the other, your body just doesn't like it, can't digest it, can't tolerate it. And then you also have the term gluten sensitivity. And gluten sensitivity is kind of, uh, it's kind of a mesh of the above two terms. It's an intolerance, it's an allergy. Nobody really specifically has laid out the strict rigid definition for what it actually means. Now, the problem with, with gluten is its association with celiac disease. You can see here, a lot of times when we use the term gluten sensitivity, we use it interchangeably with celiac disease as if the two are synonyms, but in, in actuality they're not synonyms at all. Gluten sensitivity causes celiac disease. Uh, however, because celiac disease is the one that all the researchers are focusing on, they kind of use the two terms interchangeably and it's kind of stuck. There have been several new terms that have been created in the medical literature, as you can see down here to kind of unmarry gluten sensitivity from celiac disease. And those two terms are non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a no-brainer, you can kind of piece that together. And then the other one is gluten syndrome. And gluten syndrome just means that the person eats gluten, gets sick, develops disease, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be celiac disease. So it's important uh, to note the two differences. Once again, celiac disease is a manifestation of gluten sensitivity, but gluten sensitivity in and of itself is not an actual disease. Here we go. So you can see on this diagram it kind of represents what, what I was just talking about, which is gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance is kind of at the hub, it's in the center, and it's the core, and it's not in and of itself it's not a disease. 
And then if you look straight up, you can see gluten intolerance, gluten sensitivity causes celiac disease. But it's also been shown to cause all these other conditions as well. As a matter of fact, there are over 200 medical conditions that have been linked to those with gluten sensitivity, those that have gluten intolerance. And we're talking about 200 conditions. Only one of those conditions is actually celiac disease. So I don't want you to uh, to get this get this topic confused. Gluten sensitivity and celiac disease are not the same thing. Celiac disease is a manifestation of gluten sensitivity. Gluten sensitivity is just a state of being. It's a state of who you are. It's kind of like having a peanut allergy. If you're allergic to peanuts and you eat them, you get sick. Uh, if you're not allergic to peanuts, you can eat them and you don't get sick. And the same thing goes with gluten sensitivity and eating gluten. Now there's an old school and a new school version of how we recognize gluten sensitivity slash celiac disease. But remember, we have laid out before that celiac disease and gluten sensitivity are not the same thing and that gluten sensitivity is actually not a disease but more a state of genetics which if left alone manifests as disease one of those diseases is celiac disease so old school thought is that celiac is the only manifestation of gluten sensitivity whereas the new school thought is that celiac is actually one of the more rare manifestations of gluten sensitivity and when we add all the other ways a person can react when eating gluten, uh, we actually see them to be more common. For example, migraine headache is, is one manifestation of gluten sensitivity. Psoriasis is a manifestation. So you see celiac on the spectrum or on the scope of, 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 of how people react to gluten is actually more rare than a lot of the other reactions that people can have. When looking at this next one here, intestinal biopsies are considered for celiac disease the gold standard of diagnosis and one of the reasons why is because celiac disease causes damage of the intestine that we can visible visualize uh, on a tissue sample now unfortunately uh, the biopsy is is not a very good gold standard because it's not very accurate in essence the analogy here is if we take uh, several biopsies of the intestine and we don't see the hallmark sign of celiac disease which is called villus atrophy or flattening of the intestine. Does that mean it doesn't exist? Because are the samples that we took to biopsy are they representative of 100 percent of the entire intestines? And the answer to that is obviously no. And the analogy here is take a bucket and dip it in the ocean. If you don't pull out any fish does that mean there are no fish in the ocean? Obviously that answer is no, so it's the same kind of thing with the biopsy. If we take only small sample regions and don't see damage, it doesn't mean that other areas of the, of the intestine aren't damaged. I actually had a patient uh, who after 20 years she had had 10 biopsies and of the intestine and the 10th biopsy was positive and the first nine were negative, so how do you explain to her that we missed her diagnosis uh, for 20 years and she ate gluten for 20 years and it continued to do damage to the point where it finally showed up on biopsy. It's not an acceptable gold standard. There are other tests that are used in the medical industry. These are called antibody blood tests and the antibody tests measure for reactions to immune system reactions to gluten and I'll show you a diagram here in just a minute and break that down a little bit better. But if we look over here, we can actually see there's a type of test called an HLA-DQ test, and it's a genetic test. And new school thought is that this is more of your gold standard test. In essence, it's going to be much more sensitive. It's going to pick it up you know, to a great degree of certainty for anybody who gets tested. The old school of thought on, on, on gluten sensitivity and celiac disease is that you wouldn't have gluten sensitivity unless it was affecting your intestines and that's what this means. Extra intestinal manifestations of celiac disease are rare. Well that's not necessarily true. So we look over here you can see the new school of thought is extra intestinal manifestations of gluten intolerance are actually a major cause of misdiagnosis uh, and so they actually you know these extra intestinal manifestations are actually can be more common uh, than the celiac disease itself. Now I want to skip down and show you kind of what we're taught in school when we learn about celiac disease. 
We learn to look for people that have extreme weight loss, diarrhea, stomach pain, bloating, and vomiting. And if we don't see those symptoms, that we're told not to suspect gluten sensitivity. And bottom line is there are people with weight gain. There are people that get constipated. There are people that have stomach pain, yes. Uh, but there are also people that have joint pain and not stomach pain. Uh, bloating and vomiting. Some people develop bloating and vomiting and some don't. Some develop blood in the stool and some don't. So the symptoms are very, are, are, are a wide range of varying. And if we just stick to this kind of old school of thought, which is weight loss, diarrhea, stomach pain, bloating, and vomiting, then we miss a number of cases that come into our doors. Symptoms of gluten sensitivity are oftentimes systemic, meaning they can affect any tissue in the body. And medical research has shown that gluten sensitivity, uh, gluten has affected virtually every tissue in the body in different individuals. Different people respond differently to gluten the same way different people respond differently to uh, certain medications or any other thing that they would take in. So we've seen this diagram before and once again we're looking at gluten intolerance and we see that it manifests as a number of these different conditions. One of them is celiac disease. So once again understand that gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance, and celiac disease are not synonymous but one causes the other. Now we talked earlier about gluten sensitivity and we said that it was an immune reaction or could be an immune reaction to gluten and so that's what this diagram illustrates. It illustrates all the different ways your immune system tends to try to react to things it doesn't like. So as you see here allergies equal immune reaction and there's two different kinds of immune reactions. There's what we call an acute reaction and then there's what we call a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Now an acute reaction happens within 30 minutes to 3 hours of ingesting the potential food or, or agent that you're allergic to. And the response by the body is to make this antibody called IgE, immunoglobulin E. And this antibody triggers the release of a number of different chemicals that create inflammation. And that inflammation can subsequently do tissue damage. Now symptoms of an acute allergy are listed here. You can see hives, itching, burning, swelling of the skin, skin eczema, bronchitis, asthma, coughing, sneezing, diarrhea, colic, vomiting, excessive spitting up. So these are all the symptoms that tend to happen when someone has an acute allergy. Now if we go back over here to the delayed hypersensitivity reaction, you can see there are three different ways that we react. And so one way is that we have this type of cell called a T cell that reacts. Another way is that we produce these other types of antibodies. Unlike, just like IgE, we can also make IgG, IgA, and IgM. It's speculative whether or not IgD is part of this process, so we will, we'll put a question mark here. But then we also form what are called immune complexes. And ultimately, all three of these reactions tend to lead to chemical inflammation. Now, in terms of testing, we talked about the flaws in testing and traditional testing for, for celiac disease and gluten sensitivity. Well, when we look at IgE, we do what's called a skin prick test. And this is what your allergy doctor will do. If you go into the allergy doctor, they'll put, a, put needles in your back and they'll measure inflammatory response to different agents. And so this is measured by using IgE. We also commonly will measure for celiac disease, we'll measure the gluten reactions by looking at something called IgG. Some people will look at IgA as well, but typically IgG to, to wheat is what we look for. Specifically, there's a protein in wheat called gliadin or gliadin. Remember, we talked and said that that was the prolamine subfraction of gluten found in wheat. And that's what's typically tested for when we look for celiac disease. But the big flaw in all this type of testing is that it doesn't take into consideration any of these other types of reactions. So if you've been tested and you were IgG tested and you were IgA tested and you were IgE tested and you were negative, it doesn't necessarily mean that you didn't produce IgM antibodies or immune complexes or T-cell reaction. Uh, so you can see how incomplete a lot of that testing actually is. So my advice is get all of this tested to rule out whether or not you're having an immune reaction. Now there's also what we call an intolerance reaction and the two are different. An intolerance reaction
primarily refers to not being able to tolerate a food, but the reaction is not one that's produced by the immune system. The reaction the body has is typically, it's typically found in other tissues of the body, and primarily the main tissue it's found is in the gut, in the intestines. And we call this gut dysbiosis, and what that really means is that when you, a person has an intolerance to a food, they don't digest it very well. And with that lack of digestion, that food sits there, and it feeds bacteria, and it creates these bacteria to overgrow and to become imbalanced. And then these bacteria start to make byproducts, and these byproducts can create damage to our intestine and it can cause leaks, okay, or holes in our intestinal lining. And when we have holes in our intestinal lining, we tend to develop more and more allergies as time goes by. So what does that really mean? Well, if you've got holes in your, in your intestine, realize that food traditionally is broken down into small microscopic particles. These particles are then absorbed into your gut and they're packaged and processed appropriately before they go to the bloodstream. But when you have a leaky gut, what happens is the food doesn't get broken down, it slips through these cracks in your gut. And behind your gut lining, you have more immune system cells than you have anywhere else in your body. And this immune system, it's actually, it's called a lymph tissue, it's gastro-associated lymph tissue, starts to react or respond to food because it's breaking through the gut it's leaking through and it's stimulating an immune reaction. So you can develop allergies as a result of having an intolerance. And the allergies you develop may not be the same as the intolerance that you have. So if you have gluten intolerance, you can actually develop allergies to things like dairy. You can develop allergies to things like blueberries or beans or beef or strawberries. It, it just depends on the person. Different people, once again, will react differently. And of course, as we saw before, different allergies lead to inflammation and tissue damage that's went, that then subsequently leads to disease. Now about five years ago, uh, a doctor at the University of Maryland discovered this protein called zonulin, and this is specific for gluten, that when a person has gluten intolerance, they make more of this protein, and zonulin actually breaks down your gut lining and creates this leaky gut syndrome that we we're talking about. And I want to go and scroll up a little bit and I want to show you kind of a diagram of what leaky gut looks like. So as we see leaky gut here, this diagram, this is a diagram of normal looking cells in your intestine. And so the food would travel here in the center and it would be absorbed into the cell and then the bloodstream is right behind the cell and it would be absorbed into the bloodstream and that's where it would nourish the body but what happens is you can see between this cell and this cell there's a gap that's been created well that's what leaky gut is there's a permeable hole that forms and so now gluten can get through okay and you can see how it hits the immune system and it creates an immune system reaction that leads to the destruction of these cells, but it can also lead to the production of a number of different types of antibodies. And then these antibodies can travel through the bloodstream and create tissue damage. So just like in the diagram we said tissue damage occurs uh, via the production of different types of antibodies. And once again, I'll bring up this chart as you can see, once I want to remind you that gluten sensitivity in and of itself is not a disease but the tissue damage that's a, that occurs as a result of having gluten intolerance and, and the leaky gut syndrome that's induced leads to all these different types of diseases. Now, let's take it one step further because really um, gluten is linked to so many more things than just what we just saw. I'm going to kind of show you a short list of a number of the different types of conditions that have been identified in patients with gluten sensitivity. So buckle up and hold on. Here we go. You can see on this first one, angina pectoris, anorexia, immunoglobulinopathy, antiphospholipid syndrome, anxiety, apathy, aphthous ulcers, aortic vasculitis, arthritis, a number of different types of arthritis, as you can see here, juvenile ru uh, rheumatoid arthritis, enteropathic arthritis, psori psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. We go to the next page, abdominal pain and distension, spontaneous abortions, 
Addison's disease, ADHD and ADD, alopecia, which is hair loss, a number of different types of nutritionally related anemias, ataxia, which is a fancy word for dizziness, atherosclerosis, autism and other learning disorders, cholangitis, dermatitis herpetiformans. You can see here are some samples or at least an example picture of what DH or dermatitis herpetiformans looks like. This is the most common skin manifestation of gluten sensitivity. And the list goes on and the list keeps going. You can see some of the more common ones here. Bone pain, bone fractures, cachexia. Uh, going down the list you can see melanoma and asthma and enlarging enlarged heart and uh, damage to the muscle of the heart and cataracts and uh, chelosis which is chapped lips and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease are two very common diseases that are contributed to or worsened by gluten sensitivity and the list goes on here we go with more you can see here some of the very very common things that we see here constipation diarrhea lymphoma uh, different types of other conditions you can see failure to thrive depression uh, type 1 diabetes uh, dysmenorrhea, dysmenorrhea, which is you know an absence of the menstrual cycle, dyskusia, which is an absence of taste, and it can also create lesions in the duodenum. It can create edema. It can create eczema, as you see in this picture here. Epilepsy. Uh, there was a special on Discovery Health Network not too long ago, where a young boy had uh, epilepsy and it was actually misdiagnosed what he actually had was gluten sensitivity that triggered his epileptic seizures when his mother took gluten out of his diet of course his epileptic seizures discontinued altogether spontaneous nosebleeds is another common manifestation that we see associated with gluten sensitivity and then as you go down the list you can see more and more and you go up to the next page the two that I'll point out here are malnutrition, nutritional deficiencies, and infertility. And as you see from this Newsweek cover uh, on infertility uh, and, and the role that diet and nutrition plays in, in the ability of a woman and a man to conceive a child, it's extremely important. So a person that's gluten intolerant or gluten sensitive that suffers from malabsorption or suffers from nutritional deficiencies is very often going to have problems conceiving children. Moving down the list, you could see some even more of what we saw before. And migraine headaches is a very common one. Multiple sclerosis, uh, muscle wasting, bone loss. Moving down the list, you can see another long list of different conditions. There's a picture here of vitiligo, which is a an autoimmune disease of the skin where the skin starts to lose its pigment. Now, I want to talk a little bit too about we said vitamin and mineral deficiencies were actually a part of what happens when a person is gluten intolerant and they have malabsorption. So I wanted to show you just a couple of general diagrams of how that, that malabsorption can affect uh, different organs and different tissues. As we look here, you can see this is vitamin D. 25-OHD is the name for the circulating uh, chemical that we call vitamin D. It, it's, it goes around your bloodstream and it, and it does a number of different things. You can see it goes through the kidney and becomes biologically active. Uh, but it also travels to the colon, the prostate, and the breast, travels to the white blood cells, the macrophages, and it travels to the skin. And ultimately downstream you can see it's important for calcium and, and uh, bone health. You can see that it's very important for maintaining muscle strength, muscle mass, as well as balance. And then its immune modulating effects contribute to a deficiency of vitamin D, contributes to autoimmune disease. So you can see a number of those different conditions listed here. As well, vitamin D deficiency can lead to high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and heart failure. And then again, it also creates, we now know there are more than 20 types of cancer that have been associated with vitamin D uh, because of its anti-proliferative and, and uh, any, or apoptotic effects. This next slide talks about the downstream consequences of diamond deficiency. So what we can see here, thiamine is actually vitamin B1, and what you can see here downstream, uh, when gluten induces thiamine deficiency, we can get memory loss, depression, irritability. We can develop nerve damage and subsequent neuropathy. We can develop edema and congestive heart failure, as well as muscle pain and fatigue. So the downstream or long, <coughs> excuse me, long-term effects of gluten-induced malnutrition can affect 
multiple organs, multiple tissues, uh, and multiple systems and, and lead to a, just a variety and a host of different types of problems. I want to get into now a little bit of the historical and archaeological perspectives on gluten. Uh, evidence that we have historically supports that when gluten or grain foods are introduced into the diet of man as a staple, that we see a rapid increase in chronic degenerative diseases, diseases like heart disease and cancer, uh, and poor dentition or periodontal or gum disease. Uh, we see bone loss. We see uh, a number of different other problems. Infertility is another one that we tend to see. If we look at the history of man's diet, most of our genetic history comes from hunting gathering diets and with a hunting gathering diet you can see 100 to 200 species of meat fruits and vegetables now as man moved more toward an agricultural base that diet variety diminished to 25 to 30 different species and some cultures were deriving up to 80 percent of their calories from a single grain staple now let's talk about this and how that has affected man it's really it's kind of a double-edged sword we've got the widespread introduction and use of grain uh, which altered the future of man because it allowed for modern civilization to evolve and flourish people weren't starving to death so they could focus more on specialization uh, additionally uh, it led however to the modern diseases such as cancer heart disease bone disease diabetes etc so although grains brought us a high degree of specialization in technology, they also brought us a high degree of chronic degenerative diseases. Let's talk about grain aside from gluten. So gluten aside isn't grain supposed to be healthy. The Food Guide Pyramid recommends up to 11 servings a day with 50 percent of those servings coming from whole grain sources. Well first of all you should know that the Food Guide Pyramid was uh, concocted by the United States Department of Agriculture not so much to be a guideline for healthy nutrition but more so to help sell dairy and meat and grain based products so grains supposed to be healthy let's take a look at how common grains are produced today and once again we're not even talking about gluten as being part of the problem here we're just talking about grains in general the seeds are sprayed with fungicides and insecticides uh, these fungicides and insecticides are xenoestrogens and xenoestrogens are chemical based or derived estrogens that contribute to in effect uh, contribute to hormone dysfunction and affect hormone balance a number of diseases associated with xenoestrogen exposure include breast cancer endometriosis fibrocystic breast disease and men prostate cancer is one we can also see that the seeds are doused with hormones to aid in growth um, the grains are stored in bins sprayed with additional pesticides. When we dry the grain it causes damage to its proteins and then when we process the grain to make it edible uh, we add dough conditioners and preservatives and other types of flour and extrusion which is a heat based process creates a, a carcinogenic chemical called acrylamide and we've done studies in mice with uh, heated cereal products and found that the mice that get the highest levels of acrylamide tend to die of the most cancer but also we we tend to want to add hydrogenated oils which are also uh, extremely unhealthy for us let's look at the nutrient properties of grains once again not even talking about gluten the nutrient quality of grains the first one it's a poor source of protein and leads to inadequate growth and remember when we said before that archaeological and historical data supported this well we've got fossil records that show reduction in both stature as well as osteoporosis where grains are or cereal grains are introduced into the diet additionally you can see that grains are low in EPA and DHA now these are omega-3 fats uh, grains are tend to be higher in omega-6 fats and so if we're low in EPA and DHA and we're high in omega-6 what tends to happen is our body tends to be more uh, more prone to developing chemical inflammation now additionally uh, grains contain anti-nutrients and these are chemicals within the grain that bind to minerals and prevent them from being able to absorb but there are also a number of different peptides that we've studied that for people that are genetically susceptible they can create autoimmune disease 
other effects. You can see hormonal influences linked to obesity. This is just how grain acts like sugar. Much like sugar, grain causes insulin excess. And so what does insulin do? Insulin tells the body to store fat. Insulin prevents muscle building or muscle growth. Uh, it reduces vitamin C uptake into white blood cells, which weakens the immune system. It causes loss of magnesium, which can lead to cyclical or, cyclic, or can lead to cyclical hypertension. And then it can also create sodium retention in excess, which contributes to excessive water retention and congestive heart failure. And what about infant cereals? We introduce these typically very early on in life, uh, as early as three months, in some cases even earlier. And a number of different research studies have shown that these cereals really shouldn't be introduced till after the first year of life because they predispose a child to developing a number of different health issues, one of those uh, being allergies. But uh, if they're gluten intolerant and we don't know about it and we haven't tested them, then potentially we're setting them up for very poor health at a very early stage in life. We know that gluten sensitivity uh, in infants has been linked to colic and asthma. It's been linked to chronic diarrhea and projectile vomiting. So my advice to you, if you have a baby that, that um, is manifesting any of those symptoms, it probably would be a good idea uh, to test the child for gluten sensitivity before considering putting such a young a young baby on antacid medications or any other type of medication that also could potentially harm their health. Well, I hope you've learned a little bit of more about celiac disease and the difference between it and gluten sensitivity slash syndrome slash allergy slash um, intolerance and uh, if you've got more questions or want to get more information please feel free to visit my website www.towncenterwellness.com